In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, what do all these emergency lighting terms mean? Just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of emergency lighting in association with Robus. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate to prove you've completed the course. When you're starting to grapple with emergency lighting, it can feel a bit overwhelming as all sorts of phrases and expressions get banded around and they're very easily confused with each other. So we're going to explain them here and this will help you understand the rest of the videos in this series. BS 5266-1 is the standard that acts as the base guidance for the subject of emergency lighting. It represents incredible value at a mere £410 for BSI non-members. If that's a little outside your fiscal endeavours, then the Electrician's Guide to Emergency Lighting covers much of what's contained in the standard with a particular slant towards electricians. In BS 5266-1 we find Annex F, which describes seven different modes of operation that emergency lights can operate under. These are reproduced in Table 4.4 of the Electrician's Guide to Emergency Lighting, and you can see that each one is given a number from 0 to 6. 0 is non-maintained, this means that the fitting is never illuminated as long as the supply to it is healthy and connected. When the supply fails due to either a power cut, a fault that operates the circuit protective device, or for some other reason that disconnects the supply, the battery inside the light fitting will connect to the light source and keep it illuminated for a period of time. If the power is then restored, the battery will start to recharge ready for the next power failure. One is maintained. This type of emergency light is on at all times, so if the power supply to the fitting is healthy and all is well, the light will be on. If the circuit feeding the fitting fails for some reason, the light will remain on, but now being powered by the internal battery. These two base modes of operation are then repeated with other types of emergency lighting. Those of us who are a bit longer in the tooth may remember another type of lighting that we used to call sustained. This is where an emergency light fitting would contain two or more lamps. At least one of these were connected to the backup supply and would illuminate when the power to the fitting died. The remaining lamp or lamps were connected to a switched line conductor which could be turned on and off when light was needed. This method of emergency lighting still exists, but you won't find the term sustained anywhere in BS 5266-1. It is correctly referred to as combined. Mode of operation 2 is combined and non-maintained. Mode of operation 3 is combined and maintained. For the next mode of operation, we're going to skip ahead a little and discuss number 6. This is what's referred to as satellite. Now this is where you have an emergency light fitting that doesn't have a battery backup supply inside itself, but rather derives its emergency supply from another emergency fitting. The fitting it gets its emergency supply from is referred to in our fourth and fifth modes of operation as compound self-contained emergency fittings. Number four is compound non-maintained, and number five is a maintained version of this fitting, giving us compound maintained. Just one further thing to note about this table is that it's used to create codes that identify the characteristics of emergency lighting. So rather than reading each row from left to right, which could fool you into thinking that all self-contained, non-maintained emergency lights include test devices and only need to last for 10 minutes, rather each characteristic is selected by column and then combined to give a code that tells you information about the emergency light. Now you may have noticed that I added the word self-contained to the description of the compound fitting. So why did I add it in? Well, it's to differentiate it from a whole other type of emergency lighting system, namely centrally supplied. So what does that term mean? Well, we've discussed so far the six different modes of operation. We're now going to consider the two different types of emergency lighting system. A self-contained emergency fitting is one that contains the battery backup supply inside itself, with the exception of the satellite fitting. A centrally supplied emergency luminaire is more likely to be a part of a whole system within a building that provides a backup power supply from a single point, either a large battery bank or possibly a generator, both of which are designed to spring into life in the event of a power cut. There's advantages and disadvantages to both types of system, but it's fair to say the vast majority of installations use self-contained fittings. These two types of system are given their own designation code, which is X for self-contained and Z for centrally supplied. We're now going to consider some other terms connected to emergency lighting, which relate more to the way the lighting is used. Let's paint a picture here. Imagine that it's night and a fire's broken out in a building. The insulation on the cables has melted in the fire, causing protective devices to operate, and the lighting circuits have therefore lost power. So the building is on fire and it's completely dark inside. What do you do? 
Well, in a well-designed and even better maintained building, the emergency lighting will have kicked in and depending on where you are and what you're doing in the building, it will be fulfilling one of several options. These options break down into three broad areas, emergency escape lighting, emergency safety lighting and standby lighting. First up is emergency escape lighting. This is further broken down into three further categories. The first of these is escape route lighting. In a large building, there are designated routes to get out of the building in an emergency. These have to meet certain requirements to limit the occurrence or spread of fire through them so that they stay clear for evacuation purposes. One of these requirements is to have emergency lighting in place that will illuminate the route to a sufficient level to allow people to see their way along the evacuation route to a place of safety. This is usually to the outside of the building. Interestingly, this category of lighting also includes a further subcategory of safety signs. So escape route lighting is also used to illuminate safety signs and firefighting and safety equipment that may be needed in an emergency. This subcategory is so important that we're going to devote a whole video to it later on in this series. Moving on to our next category of emergency escape lighting, we've got open area anti-panic lighting. In something like a large sports hall in an educational building or a leisure centre, it may not be clear how to get out in the event of an emergency and therefore there needs to be enough emergency lighting to see by and also indicate the direction to leave in. It's typically required in areas of 60 metres squared or more, but may be needed in smaller areas if there's an additional hazard such as use by a large number of people who might obstruct signs. Then there's the third category of emergency escape lighting, which is high risk task area lighting. This is required in areas to protect people who are engaged in potentially dangerous processes or situations and need sufficient light to shut things down safely. A good example is an industrial kitchen where people are working with sharp knives, boiling hot fluids and naked flames. Now we move back up the hierarchy of emergency lighting and move across to emergency safety lighting. Notice that now we've lost the word escape from this type of lighting. There are of course reasons why standard lighting may be disconnected from the supply other than a fire breaking out, maybe due to a fault on a circuit or an external power cut. In some circumstances, evacuation of the occupants may actually present a higher risk to them than keeping them in the building. A good example might be a care home where moving elderly or infirm people outside could cause injury or harm through exposure. If that's the case, then it can be better to leave people where they are, but still ensure that there is sufficient emergency lighting to allow a measure of comfort and reasonably safe activity. This is what we mean by emergency safety lighting, and you may hear it referred to as stay put lighting. Of course, there are limits to how long emergency lighting can be provided for and situations change, so there may come a point where it is necessary to evacuate even elderly or infirm people. And so emergency escape may become necessary if say there's only one hour of emergency lighting left in the system. These decisions will be made by the responsible person. More on them in a later video. Then moving across our chart, we come to standby lighting. Notice this is separate from emergency escape and emergency safety lighting. It's emergency lighting that is designed to allow normal activity to continue in the event of the general lighting failing. It's intended to minimize disruption to normal activities when lighting fails. Interestingly though, it's a requirement that if the light levels provided by the emergency standby lighting is lower than the level of light provided by the normal lighting system, it should only be used to shut down or terminate processes. It's different to high risk task area lighting as it can be required for less dangerous activities and can be designed to keep activity going rather than just facilitate shutdown and escape. The requirements for standby lighting are also far less stringent and specific than high risk task area lighting. So there we go, that's some important definitions of terms used in connection with emergency lighting, but you may be wondering about some of the requirements and practicalities of actually installing emergency lighting correctly. Well, to find out more, check out this video right here, or click the link in the description below to watch it as part of our free training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate as well. For further information on emergency lighting from Robust, check out their latest catalogue, or get in touch with them via email on info at All that remains in this video is to say, thank you very much for watching.